In this video, I'm going to give you an overview of viruses, a very brief overview, and then I'm going to spend most of the time talking about SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that is responsible for the COVID-19 pandemic. So viruses are classified by biologists as non-living. Um, so what are the criteria that biologists use to define something as living? I'm going to list them. So um, live, uh, for organisms that have some sort of order in their structure, um, those who can respond to stimuli from the environment. If you were to touch this plant, it's going to shrivel up itself. So usually living things can respond to stimuli in the environment. Living things can reproduce. They can regulate to maintain a stable internal environment. They are capable of evolutionary adaptation. Uh, they can acquire and process energy from the environment, and then they're able to undergo growth and development. So the reasons that uh, viruses are not classified as living, it's because they can't do either at least one of these. So one of the most important ones is that they cannot do energy processing and metabolism on their own. They need a host to be able to do this. Otherwise they have a order and then they can reproduce even though they need a host, but they can reproduce. And they are capable of evolutionary adaptation and they can kind of start from um, um, simpler structures inside the cell and then build up to make the final um, virus. But the, the reason that they're not considered as living is because they, uh, there's at least one of these things that they cannot do on their own. They need a host. So viruses have different morphologies. They have, uh, they come in um, basically in a broad category of three different structures. They can be either helical, they have a, uh, can have a really complex isohedral structure. This outside is all made of protein, or they could be complex. And the complex ones actually have a plasma membrane uh, that is enveloping them. Uh, enveloping the genetic material. And usually this plasma membrane is derived from the host that the virus infected and used to make more virus. So in the helical ones, an example of it is tobacco mosaic virus. It's a virus that infects plants. The genetic material is inside this, what's called capsid, which is a complex protein structure. The same thing with isohedral ones, uh, human rhino, virus, the, um, that's the structure of a virus that is um, an isohedral one, so that outside is protein, inside the genetic material, and then smallpox, uh, the virus that causes smallpox is a complex, and also the coronavirus that we're dealing with right now is also a, a complex virus. It has an outside plasma membrane. That's why an effective way, probably most effective way to uh, prevent catching this virus is washing your hands and anything uh, that has the virus with soap because soap dissolves the plasma membrane. So classification of viruses is based on uh, the um, type of genome that they have and um, how the genome is processed inside the cell. This is called the Baltimore classification. It's the most modern way of classifying viruses. They're classified into seven groups. So some viruses, uh, their genome is double-stranded DNA. Some have single-stranded DNA. Some have double-stranded RNA. Uh, some of them have single-stranded RNA, which is positive sense. And that means that the RNA can directly be used to make protein and the COVID-19 virus um, is a single-stranded RNA that has a, a positive sense. Um, the single, we have single-stranded RNA viruses that are negative strand. 
Uh, this, an example of that is the flu virus. Uh, so their RNA that exists in the, in the virus that is injected into the cell actually can't be used to make protein. So the messenger RNA, positive strand messenger RNA has to be transcribed from the RNA genome. Then you have ones that have single-stranded RNA, but they have an enzyme called reverse transcriptase, which makes DNA from the genome of the RNA, and that DNA gets incorporated into the genome of the host. And then we have double-stranded DNA viruses, which also have reverse transcriptase, and then the viral genome um, is replicated through an RNA intermediate. So the RNA may serve directly as messenger RNA as a template to make messenger RNA. So the different types of genome that they have and the way that genome is used to in the cells to make more RNA. So the um, again, the virus that is causing COVID-19, which is a class of coronaviruses, um, are called positive slant RNAs. The common cold virus is also a positive strand RNA. The flu virus is negative strand. So one of the things that um, is often, one of the questions that comes up is, well, can't we treat the coronavirus that we're dealing with with the same methods that we're treating flu virus? Well, no, because they're totally different viruses. So let's take a look at the life cycle of these two viruses. So the life cycle of the flu virus um, has different stages. Um, so here's the virus. It recognizes the cell through binding two receptors on the surface of the cell, and it gets it attaches to the cell. Then it enters the cell, and then the cell engulfs the virus, then it kind of, uh, the virus kind of breaks apart, and then the RNA of the virus, remember it's a negative sense RNA, so the cell can't use it to make protein, so it enters the nucleus, and in the nucleus, a positive sense RNA is made, and then that RNA goes back into the uh, cytoplasm to make viral proteins. And then um, the viral proteins that are made then also is used to make the negative strand RNA. Uh, so then once everything is ready, then they are packaged. So um, so we get attempt, at attachment, entry, replication, assembly, and egress. That means the virus is shed out. Now, what does the coronaviruses look like? Well, here's a summary. This is a coronavirus. The structures that are protruding out of the virus, this is called the S protein, they bind to specific receptors on the human cells. So these receptors are all over the place in our body. So upon binding, they the virus can enter the cell and then it can spit its RNA inside the cell. And since it's a positive strand, it is immediately used by ribosome inside the cell to make a virus polymerase. And the virus polymerase uses the positive strand to make a negative strand RNA. And then that negative strand RNA again is used to make positive strand RNAs again, which are used to make a bunch of different things. First of all, uh, this cell uh, uses the positive strand RNA to make what's called the N protein. The N protein binds to the viral RNA that is just, that was just made. Um, and then there's also other proteins that are made in here, which is one of them is the M protein, uh, which is component of the plasma membrane, final plasma membrane of the virus. Now, since all of these proteins are going to be shed out through the secretion system of the cell, they all end up going into the endoplasmic reticulum, then into the Golgi apparatus. 
um, obviously also the this the receptor this protein that is projecting out of the virus called the s protein is made and also there is this little protein outside of the coronavirus which identifies certain carbohydrates on the surface of human cells that's also made so everything is made within the endoplasmic reticulum and and then into the golgi and then a golgi vesicle is made which is going to fuse with the plasma membrane and spit the virus out so as you can see its life cycle and its shape its components the way the virus is made is quite different from the flu virus so here's a more detailed picture of the coronavirus coat this is a very very important part of the virus it's as you can see here it's three separate parts it has three separate subunits and this is what makes these spikes in here now whether or not a coronavirus can infect a human being depends on how well of a fit this s protein makes with the receptors that are sitting on our plasma membrane and the current coronavirus it the s protein for this current coronavirus is a really nice fit with the receptors that is present on our cells so this is the plasma membrane envelope of the cell that's the protein that i mentioned that binds to carbohydrates on the surface of the cells and then that's the rna bound to the end protein <clears throat> so what are coronaviruses and where do they come from and how do they transfer into us so coronaviruses are a diverse and huge class of viruses um, and one group that affects us are called the beta coronaviruses which are shown in here the this image is showing you the mild infections viruses that give you a mild infection or severe infection and then uh, this arrow shows spillover from one organism to the next so you can see at the top in here these are mildly in mild provide mild infection in human beings these are all common cold viruses so if you ever catch a cold every year you have caught a coronavirus so um, the coronaviruses have natural hosts meaning they exist in naturally in certain organisms most of the hosts for um, coronaviruses for most cases are bats but there are also coronaviruses that live in mice uh, or in rodents that's where the original based on sequencing that's where coronaviruses have been found and then they've also found scientists have also found coronaviruses that are in um, cows in I think this is an emu in what are called civets kind of there's kind of a cats camels and pigs and based on sequence similarity for some of these coronaviruses we're pretty certain of the way it's transferred to us so for example for a couple of cold viruses um, according to sequence analysis scientists are pretty confident that uh, the original coronavirus lived in bats and then it went into these I think emus I don't know what you call this organism and then it was transferred to human beings some in this in this case the coronavirus lived in rodents and then it was transferred to cows and then it was transferred to us for the final uh, group of common cold viruses it is thought that it was present in rodents but they have not been able to find the organism that was the intermediate that then transferred to us so what does that mean that means usually the coronavirus that is found in us for example let's say hcovoc43 has some very 
close similarity, sequence similarity with the one in the cow. And the one in the cow has very close sequence similarities with the one that is in the rodent. And as you go towards the human subject, the sequence similarity between the rodent and the human decreases. So um, that is how scientists determine the path that the virus takes. So now let's focus on the more deadlier ones. Um, these are SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV. SARS was responsible for the pandemic of 2002 to 2003, which killed a lot of people. And scientists are pretty confident that this virus lived in bats that gave it to this wild cats and these wild cats somehow were uh, domesticated. Um, but some of these wildcats are also were sold in live animal um, markets, and that's how it made it to human beings. Then MERS-CoV, it uh, was primarily found in Middle Eastern countries. So if you ever, uh, if you've never heard of it, that's because it never made it to our shores. As, and scientists are pretty confident based on sequence analysis that it originated in bats, then it was transferred to camels, and then from camels it was transferred to human beings. And as you know, in some parts of the Middle East, camels are a very common mode of transportation. Then we have SARS-CoV, which in 2016 to 2017 in the Guangdong province of China, of China, it killed more than 90% of piglets five days or younger. And again, um, it uh, was quite devastating for, for the farming industry. So that's basically an overall of what is known about coronaviruses that infect human beings. And what this chart doesn't show is SARS-CoV-2, which is the one that uh, is causing the pandemic now. And that's because it's a, it's a new virus. This paper was published in March of 2000, I believe 19. And um, by the time it was published, we had not known about the COVID-19, the virus that is responsible for COVID-19. Let's compare to different type of coronaviruses. So uh, we have some of the common coronaviruses of the common cold, the SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV, which you saw in the previous slide, and the current SARS-CoV-2. Now, as you probably know, the common cold just gives you uh, congestion and inflammation in your nose, but it's really not lethal. And its site of infection is only in the upper respiratory tract. <clears throat> SARS-CoV-1 and MERS-CoV, their site of infection is the lower respiratory tract. It's in the lungs. And that's why um, they're, they're not as contagious as other coronaviruses like the common cold or SARS-CoV-2 because a lot of the um, contagiousness comes from the fact that the virus infects your upper respiratory tract and you sneeze and cough and you give it to somebody else. However, the consequences of SARS-CoV-1 and MERS-CoV are more severe than the common cold for the person who gets it because it leads to a cytokine storm, which you will learn in the immunology unit and uh, it damages the lung cells. So, and it can, it's uh, more severe than the common cold and it can give rise to death. Then we have the SARS-CoV-2, which is the current, the uh, reason behind the virus, behind the current pandemic. Uh, this virus can infect both the upper respiratory tract and the lower respiratory tract. It's also, been uh, observed infecting the heart, intestine, and eyes. Not only it has a wider range of places it can infect, both the upper and lower respiratory tract, um, it also more sticky. So what does that mean? Now viruses uh, identify and adhere to host cells through 
uh, interaction between their surface proteins on their surface and the surface of the cell. And this is no exception for coronaviruses. Now the protein that are on the surface of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus is much more strongly interacting with the receptors on the surface of our cells. And that's why it is, um, <clears throat> it is more infectious, one of the reasons it's more contagious and deadly. Um, also the fact that it, it also infects the upper respiratory tract, it means that it's uh, more contagious than the SARS-CoV-1 and MERS-CoV. And SARS-CoV-2 also um, gives rise to cytokine, cytokine storm and it damages the lungs. And that's why it is very deadly. So this is a relatively new virus. There is a lot not known about it. And now some of the questions may that have been asked, is this virus going to disappear like SARS-CoV-1 and MERS-CoV? We really don't know. Uh, so far, it doesn't look like it. Can we eradicate this virus with a vaccine? Just like we did with polio, we really don't know yet. The One of the first vaccines just today was uh, approved in UK and um, hopefully we're gonna get also um, get it approved in the United States. We're a little bit um, more careful in the United States by giving approval to vaccines. So there's still the scientists at the FDA are still looking at the data. Uh, there is this rumor going on that this virus was specifically manufactured in the lab, but scientists who um, use DNA sequencing and evolutionary analysis who have checked these viruses they cannot find uh, data that would support the idea that this virus would have been created in a lab. And uh, another important question, is there going to be another v um, coronavirus attack outbreak in the near future? And the answer is very likely because these viruses are still lurking in their hosts, uh, in animals who can easily transfer to humans, they're still in uh, present in nature. Okay, so where are coronaviruses in the world? And this is about the data, this summarizes data about what we know from SARS-CoV, the virus that um, caused SARS. Uh, but this basically studying SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV allows scientists to really understand how coronaviruses function. So it is known SARS-related uh, um, coronaviruses, so viruses that are coronaviruses and are very closely related to the one that caused the pandemic in sequence. They're found in uh, wild animals in Europe, Africa, China, and Southeast Asia. Um, now there are there are places in the world like there is a particular cave in the Yunnan province, province in China uh, where there's a lot of bats and there is a whole variety of different coronaviruses that living these in these bats in this province. And that is a great cooking pot for producing new coronaviruses because the way coronaviruses change is by one of the major ways that they change is by doing recombination, by exchanging pieces with other viruses. They do mutate, but not as often as flu viruses because they, coronaviruses has a way of correcting mutations. But what they do really well is exchange pieces with other coronaviruses and just they make new flavors of coronaviruses. And if you can imagine, if you keep making new flavors of coronaviruses and humans come in, come in contact with them, then natural selection will select the ones that can use humans as a host. This is why it is extremely important that we fund the scientists who are actively growing, going into the different parts of the world and studying coronaviruses and other types of viruses in the world. If we do not do this research, we will not be prepared 
for future pandemics. We will not be able to predict what kind of viruses are going to come out of nature. So supporting scientific research in studying viruses in the world is really important, especially viruses that transfer from animals to human beings. These are called zoonotic viruses. So I wanted to spend some time to uh, maybe correct some disinformation that is out there. And there is a lot of them, and it's easy to get confused. Some of these posters that I'm showing you are directly from the World Health Organization. So one question has been, do vaccines against pneumonia protect you against the new coronavirus? No, that's uh, the answer is no, because pneumonia is caused by a bacteria and that um, the, uh, the vaccines against pneumonia is not going to protect you against this virus. Does the new coronavirus affect older people or young people also susceptible? Everybody gets infected. It doesn't matter if you're old or young. The reason it's as older people may be more susceptible to dying from coronavirus is because they have underlying conditions. They have asthma, diabetes, other conditions, but everyone gets in infected with coronavirus. And actually, uh, the latest news is that um, emergency physician doctors are seeing some very strange um, immune and reactions into kids that have been um, infected with the coronavirus, which is, again, a result of this virus being so new. We just don't know enough about it. So you don't only need to protect um, old people from this. Everybody needs to be protected. Um, can the coronavirus be transmitted in areas with hot and humid climates? Yes, it's not only in the cold climates. Uh, would exposing yourself to sun or high temperatures prevent COVID-19? No, it does not. Does 5G mobile networks spread COVID-19? Uh, that's another disinformation that is out there. Why? How do we know? Because there are places in the world where there is no 5G and coronavirus is still spreading nicely. So if 5G was doing something, then those places that don't have 5G should not have any problems with coronavirus. <clears throat> uh, would you, by either consuming or spraying yourself with bleach or putting it in your veins or disinfectants will protect you from COVID-19? Well, it may, but it also will kill you. So um, don't use disinfectants uh, on your body or in your body. Would adding pepper to your soup or other material prevent cure or cure COVID-19? There is absolutely no evidence to support. Now, um, one treatment that has been used for coronavirus patients is using corticosteroids. These are uh, drugs that dampens the immune system. And uh, you have heard me say that these viruses cause a cytokine storm and the cytokine storm is a result of um, the reaction of our immune system to a viral infection. And that cytokine storm basically can kill a patient. So <clears throat> this, the, this data, this assertion is correct. Um, so dexamethasone and hydroco uh, hydrocortisones have been used in severe patients, pe people that are really severely sick with coronavirus to reduce their mortality. Um, but the who suggests that you don't give it to people that have uh, that are not um, suffering from a very severe COVID-9 case because it may give rise to um, side effects. Now this uh, wearing a mask has been very um, politicized and it's unfortunate because masks are uh, one of the um, most and simplest, most effective and simplest ways of uh, stopping this virus from spreading. And there is this uh, 
misinformation that you get CO2 intoxication from uh, wearing a mask, your oxygen level goes down, which is uh, basically can't be further from the truth. It is not only effective, and if you can think about um, doctors who do surgery, 13, 12, 13 hour surgeries, they're wearing masks all the time. Um, so if wearing masks was toxic and would reduce their oxygen levels, surgeons would be in trouble because they wear it long, long hours. So this is um, this information that it would give you to intoxication with CO2 and oxygen deficiency. It's, it's not correct. So um, wear a mask. There are many vaccines, so as I just finished telling you that uh, coronavirus is an RNA virus, and there are many vaccines that work against the RNA viruses. They're on the market. Influenza, measles, mumps, rubella, rabies, yellow fever, and Ebola. So if you ever hear in a documentary or something or somebody on Facebook saying there's no vaccine currently on the schedule for any RNA virus that works, that is a false statement. And stay away from people who tell you these false information. Another thing uh, that I've heard is that people say, well, there are millions of people that die of cancer, but there are not that many that are dead because of COVID-19. Why are we making so, such a fuss about it? There are not that many people dead. Well, this is a false equivalent argument. It's like comparing apples and oranges. It is true that many people die of cancer every year, but cancer is not contagious. You do not get cancer by being in the same room as someone who has cancer. That's the difference. The COVID-19 is contagious and it's deadly. Cancer is deadly, but it's not contagious. That's why we're freaking out about this. Does not say that death by cancer is not significant. It's just they're, they're not comparable. Now, what you want to guard uh, yourself and also your loved ones is against this kind of thinking. So here it is a graph over time, which shows a number of new cases of coronavirus. If we don't do any social distancing or any preventive measures, the number of cases skyrockets. But if we do, do prevention and precaution efforts, which most places are doing, then we can bend the curve. And the curve, hopefully, is going to uh, level off. Now, when we get close to this uh, section and then the number of cases going down, be cautious about this misrepresentation. See, it wasn't so bad, we overreacted. And the problem with this is that vaccines and prevention measures are kind of the victim of their own success. They are successful when things don't happen. So if we in California, for example, are very cautious about not closing businesses and wearing masks and making masks mandatory, and then over time we see that really the cases of coronavirus in California isn't really too high, that's because we did something. Things didn't happen because we were careful. So be careful with this, ar with this argument. This is a false argument. Things didn't happen. Things didn't get bad because we did prevention. Now, it's so hard to find credible information about coronavirus, easy to get uh, sucked in by, by conspiracy theorists and false information. So I wanted to give you some resources that I follow. So I have these two scientists, one of them is a, um, both of them actually are virologists. Uh, I've been following the mad virologist for a long time. He shares very uh, useful information and if you direct uh, message him, he'll actually answer you. He's a very nice guy. Dr. Tara Smith, she uh, is actually, her specialty in, zoo is in zoonic diseases, 
diseases and viruses that transfer from animals to human beings. So she's a, she's an expert in this topic. Since coronaviruses are transferred from animals to human beings, she's the person to go to. Here's a blog, Science-Based Medicine, which um, it's um, a system of blog posts that is written by scientists and health professionals. It's a very good way to find uh, credible information. And obviously, the World Health Organization, I've provided a link for you here. That's uh, one of the other credible places to get information. Uh, finding rogue YouTube channels and um, other ridiculous conspiracy sites is not the place to get information. Um, so politicians also don't know what they're talking about. So get the information from the people who know what they're talking about. Dr. Fauci is also a fantastic source of information because he's an infectious disease expert and he's been honest with us all throughout this pandemic.